Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the Atlanta History Center. I'm Sal Salella, President and CEO of the Atlanta History Center, and we're delighted to welcome you all here this evening. Once again, we are indebted uh, to the Livingston Foundation of Atlanta for its generous support. As you know, the Livingston Lectures uh, feature scholarly addresses by our nation's most prominent historians. And our guest this evening, Leokut Ahmed, will speak for approximately 40 minutes and then answer questions from the audience for about 15 or 20 minutes. And we ask you to come again, please, to these two microphones that are in the aisle to ask your questions. And I want to remind you that there will be a book signing immediately afterward in the atrium following the lecture. And of course, as always, books are available for sale. At this time, we ask you to turn off all your cell phones, pagers, anything else that makes noise. And please refrain from emailing or texting during the program. Thank you. I want to mention that the Elson lecture, our next lecture, comes up June 23rd. Uh, David Stewart will uh, present uh, his book, Impeached, which is about the trial of Andrew uh, Johnson, Lincoln's uh, successor. Uh, I want to thank you if you're a member of the History Center. And if you're not, we'd love to sign you up. Leokut Ahmed holds degrees in economics from Harvard and Cambridge universities and has been a professional investment manager for 25 years. He is currently an advisor to several hedge fund firms, is a director of Aspen Insurance, and is on the board of trustees of the Brookings Institutions. Institution. Lords of Finance is his first book. Please welcome him. Many thanks, Sal. Uh, I'm very honored to be invited to speak here today. Uh, I would like to thank the Atlanta History Center for inviting me and uh, to the Livingston Foundation for its gen generous sponsorship. It turns out that Georgia is the perfect place for giving a talk on central banks and uh, financial crises. Uh, for in some respects, this state can be thought of as the birthplace of the Federal Reserve System. Uh, Ninety-seven years ago, in 1912, six men, four New York bankers, Senator Nelson Aldridge of Rhode Island, um, and an assistant secretary of the Treasury, gathered in secret at Jekyll Island off the coast of this state, uh, which, was then a privately, which was then privately owned by the very exclusive Jekyll Island Country Club, or Jekyll Island Club. There had been this terrible financial crisis in 1907, and the U.S. banking system had only been saved uh, by decisive action on the part of the banker, J.P. Morgan. Um, it, was about the, it was, in fact, the second time that he had intervened personally to bail out the U.S. financial system. In the aftermath of 1907, it became clear that the U.S. could not afford to rely on a single man to guarantee its financial stability, especially since he was now over 70, uh, was less interested in banking, and was um, focused mainly on amassing an unsurpassed art collection and spending time on his yacht with his bevy of middle-aged mistresses. Um, the result of that secret meeting on Jekyll Island was the creation of the Federal Reserve System, the first true central bank that the United States had ever had. The, architect, the architects of the system thought that its most important function and that its real purpose was not in the setting of interest rates, but would, would be to deal with bank panics and other financial crises, to try to forestall them if possible, and to handle the consequences if necessary. Now, financial crises are nothing new. Uh, they've been around for a very long time, ever since the invention of credit, in fact. The, f the first documented financial panic can be dated to AD 33, um, when uh, a run developed on the credit system of the Roman Empire, and the Emperor Tiberius uh, was forced to inject a million gold pieces to 
save the, keep the uh, imperial financial system from collapsing. Um, not only have, have financial panics been with us for a very long time, there have been a lot of them over the years. Uh, by one count, there had been 50 different episodes since the, sixth, since the 17th century. When those men on Jekyll Island came up with the idea of the Fed in 1912, they truly believed that financial crises would now be a thing of the past. And yet, within 15 years of the creation of the Fed, the world faced the single greatest economic and financial cataclysm in its history. What happened? What went wrong? That is the story set out in my book, Lords of Finance. Now, obviously, in a 30 to 40 minute talk like this, I can't hope to summarize the full story. But let me try and give you the, um, the outlines. And let me first start with the principal cast of characters, uh, because at its heart, my book is not simply about policies, but about people, um, about how men in charge of economic policy are just as fallible as anyone else, and how dramatic the consequences of their mistakes can be. Uh, that, it seems to me, is a theme that resonates today. In the early 20th century, Britain and the pound sterling were the linchpins of the global financial system. The central figure in my book was thus the governor of the Bank of England, Montague Norman. Most people don't know his name at the moment. But in the early part of the 20th century, he was the most important central banker in the world. His name evoked the sort of mystique that at, at, his, at, its height, at his height, Alan Greenspan's did. And, you know, very poignantly, his, his reputation created, created in much the same way and for some of the same reasons that Mr. Greenspan's has done. Norman came from the big British banking aristocracy. His father's family owned a bank called Martin's Bank, which is now part of Bar uh, Barclays, while his maternal grandfather was the senior partner of Brown Shipley, the English arm of Brown Brothers. Both his grandfathers were on the board of the Bank of England, then and still now quaintly known as the Court of the Bank of England. Um, it was then run like a private club. Uh, so, both of his one of his grandfathers eventually became the governor, and so the governorship of the Bank of England was almost like a hereditary position for him. He was, however, a very unbankly like man. At the time, most bankers, the typical costume for most bankers was a top hat and a frock coat. Uh, Norman insisted on wearing a, a large black floppy hat a, a black cape, and a large emerald tie pin. Uh, the New York Times once described him as looking like the chief conspirator out of an Italian opera. <laughs> um, though the fate of the British uh, uh, economy largely depended on his decisions, he did not believe in economics. He once told the chief economist of the Bank of England, uh, your job is not to tell us what to do, but to tell us why we did what we did. Um, on the other hand, he did believe in esoteric religions and dabbled in spiritualism. Um, he also suffered from a major problem as a central banker. He suffered from severe manic depression. Um, at times of crisis, he was simply unable to cope with the tension and would regularly have nervous breakdowns and take to his bed. Um, I don't have to tell you that that's not a good attribute for a central banker. Um, his best friend was Benjamin Strong, the governor of the New York Fed, who, by the way, had been one of the four bankers at that secret meeting on jo Jekyll Island in 1912. Uh, the Federal Reserve in those days was a very different institution. When Congress created the Fed in 1914, um, it was worried about investing too much power in a single institution. So instead of creating one central bank, it created 12 mini central banks, 12 regional reserve banks. The Federal Reserve Board in Washington 
was essentially a supervisory body, a sort of a regulatory agency. Woodrow Wilson, then president, argued that the board should not have any bankers on it because um, they would tend to be biased in favor of the banking industry. Um, as a result, it was filled with minor political hacks and small-town businessmen who knew nothing about finance or banking. Um, as the governor of the New York Fed, um, the largest of the regional reserve banks, uh, Benjamin Strong was essentially the most important financial official in the U U.S. Um, appointed at the head of the Fed at the age of 41, um, he was part of a generation that were protégés of J.P. Morgan, who'd come to maturity uh, in the years just before the First World War, and believed that it was time for the U.S. to begin exerting um, its financial muscle on the world stage. One of the fun things about writing a book is um, it's coming up with epigraphs at the beginning um, of each chapter. The epigraph for the chapter that introduces Benjamin Strong is a quote by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Show me a hero and I will write you a tragedy. <laughs> um, for all his success as a banker, Strong unfortunately had a very tragic personal life. Uh, his first wife committed suicide in 1905. He remarried a young woman half his age, uh, an heiress, the daughter of the chairman of the bank, of Bankers Trust, um, who actually happened to be his boss. In 1916, his second wife left him because in taking the job of the New York, at the head of the New York Fed, he had to take a very large salary cut, and she found it difficult to cope with uh, the change in their lifestyle. That same year, he developed tuberculosis on a trip to Europe. The disease was then the single most important cause of death, and before antibiotics, there was no cure. Uh, doctors recommended patients move to sanatoria high up in the mountains because they believed that the thin, dry air would allow your lungs to regenerate. So here was Strong after the First World War, trying to keep the world afloat um, with a sort of tragic personal life, suffering from tuberculosis, and at the same time uh, spending months at a time in the mountains of Colorado trying to recuperate. Uh, he started taking a lot of morphine for the pain and basically destroyed his digestive system. Supposedly morphine does that. And in 1928, he was hospitalized with diverticulitis and died tragically on the operating table. Uh, many people, including such prominent economists as Irving Fisher of Yale, Milton Friedman of Chicago, believe that if uh, that had Strong lived, uh, the Great Depression would not have happened. Um, and the history of the world in the 20th century might have been very different. Uh, it certainly makes you think. Um, in the 1920s, Ben Strong and Monty Norman became great friends. Uh, they would vacation twice a year together. Monty would come over to the States uh, for Christmas, and they would go up to Maine for a few weeks. Uh, then Ben would take a liner over to Europe in May, and he'd spend four months in Europe for the summer. Uh, this was uh, a very different era long before Blackberries were invented. <laughs> um, and um, after visiting central bankers in Europe, Ben and Monty would go off to some very nice resorts, uh, one year they went to Biarritz, um, another year to the Hotel du Cap on Cap d'Antibes. Just as an aside, if you've never been there, it's the most beautiful hotel in the world. Um, the third character of the whole plot was the president of the Reichsbank, Yalma Schacht, or to give him his full name, Horace Greeley Yalma Schacht. Uh, so named because his father once lived in Brooklyn and was a big fan of Horace Greeley's. Schacht was a brilliant man, but a complete opportunist. Uh, he came to power in 1923 and saved Germany from hyperinflation. Uh, during the 1920s, he oversaw an economic miracle in Germany. Um, despite, um, uh, despite gigantic reparations that Germany um, owed to the Allies, uh, he presided over a boom essentially fueled by foreign borrowing. Um, and Schacht very deliberately allowed Germany to get into debt to American bankers 
figuring that if you owed a lot of money to American bankers, they would exert their influence to persuade the British and the French to moderate their influence, uh, to moderate their demands on Germany. In 1930, after the Great Crash, uh, Schacht realized that Germany was going to go through the ringer. So he resigned. Now, just as an aside, one of the most uh, difficult things um, in writing history is attributing motives to people. Uh, there's usually no ambiguity about what they did. It's often very hard to figure out why they did it. Um, and uh, they themselves are not ver al always the most um, honest um, confessors of why they did something. Often they don't know themselves. Um, any case, the usual interpretation is that Chuck did it out of very cynical motives. He resigned. He resurfaced three years later in 1933 uh, when Adolf Hitler came to power. He, went back, uh, he came back as president of the Reichsbank in 1933. A year later, he was Hitler's minister of the economy. During the 1930s, he presided over a second economic miracle in Germany, a very different one from the earlier one. Um, the 1920s economic miracle had been built on borrowed money, but Germany had defaulted all, on all its debts in 1930, and so the economic miracle of the 1930s in Germany was built on autarky and re rearmament. Uh, just to continue Schacht's story, he fell out with Goering in 1939 over the pace of re rearmaments. He spent the war as a private citizen. And though he was part of the German resistance to Hitler, he was somewhat on the fringes because no one ever trusted him. Uh, a contemporary once said of him, Schacht is a man who has no friends, only enemies. Um, he was arrested by the Nazis following the July 20th assassination plot and sent to Dachau. When the Americans arrived in 1945, uh, Schacht thought he would be greeted as a hero, he would be freed as a hero, and he even harbored hopes of being asked to be president of a post-war Germany. Uh, instead, they, the Americans arrested him, and he was one of the main people tried at Nuremberg. Um, he was one of three who was acquitted, and then lived to a ripe old age of 90-something, uh, and died in 1970. So the, here was a man with nine lives. Uh, the final principal character in this book is a Frenchman, Emile Moreau. Um, unlike the others, he was a civil servant, um, not a banker, a member of the elite French uh, cadre inspecteur des finances. Um, he was like a character out of Flaubert. Uh, he remained the mayor of his little town outside Poitiers for 35 years, and while acting as the governor of the central bank, would periodically uh, go off to run things in his little village. Um, I mean, indeed, there were times when um, there were a couple of big conference, international conferences over uh, war debts where he insisted everything go on hold so that he could go back to his village and run for re-election as mayor. Um, like so many Frenchmen of the time, uh, Moreau believed that international finance was an Anglo-Saxon conspiracy designed to keep France in its place. Some things never seem to change. <laughs> Um, he refused to learn English. He hated Montague Norman, whom he accused of plotting against France. Uh, Norman reciprocated the feeling and treated Moreau with great condescension. So as you can tell from these four brief peer, uh, portraits of the personalities, they're all interesting in their own right. But they also provided a very nice frame for telling the story of the Great Depression. Uh, really for two reasons. One is that I wanted to turn the spotlight not on the economy, but on the decision makers driving the economy. And here were four decision makers that were central to, to what happened. Uh, secondly, one of the hardest things uh, when you're writing history is to convey the sense of uncertainty of time going forward. I mean, if you think about now, do we have a clue, you know, what this year, how this year is going to turn out? 
Is the stimulus package going to work? Have the bank bailout packages worked? Will we be out of a recession? Will we be uh, you know, heading into an even deeper recession? And conveying that uncertainty of the lived-in moment is very hard when you're writing history because we all know how things turned out. And I thought writing a book by uh, sort of looking over the shoulders of some of the key players would bring out that, that um, enormous uncertainty. Um, so these were four central bankers who made a terrible mistake. What was that mistake? Uh, it was to take the world back onto the gold standard after the First World War. Um, they thought that by trying to turn the clock back to what they thought of as a golden age before the First World War, uh, they were rescuing the world from monetary chaos. Uh, instead of saving the world, they set the stage for and presided over the greatest economic collapse. Uh, let me spend a couple of moments on what happened um, and why the gold standard was such a bad idea. The first key problem with the gold standard was that gold supplies had not kept up with the growth in the economy and prices. So there was a constant shortage of gold. Uh, going back to the gold standard was like putting the world into a uh, excessively tight straitjacket. The second problem was that after the turmoil of the First World War, most of the world's bullion ended up in the US. Um, international finance was like a game of poker where one player has amassed all the chips and the other players have no chips. And as a consequence, the game never just gets off the ground. Uh, central bankers, having put the world back onto the gold standard, Central bankers were only able to keep the world afloat during the 1920s uh, by keeping credit in the U.S. artificially cheap and by trying to keep Europe afloat, particularly Germany and Britain, on borrowed money. It was a system that had the seeds of its own destruction. Uh, cheap credit in the U.S. precipitated a bubble on the U.S. stock exchange the Fed, therefore, now became torn between two conflicting goals. One was to prop up Europe, and the second was to control speculation on Wall Street. Um, it tried to do both, and whenever the Fed tries to do too many things, it ended up achieving neither. Its attempt to curb stock, stock speculation were too half-hearted, um, and so that, they, they didn't work, but they were powerful enough to cause a collapse in lending to Europe. That drove most of Central Europe, particularly Germany, into a depression. So Germany was the first country to go into depression. Eventually, in the last week of October 1929, the stock market bubble burst, um, plunging the U.S. into its own recession. There's obviously a lot to unpack here. So perhaps the best way of tracing what happened then is to go through some of the parallels what, uh, of what happened then with what, what has happened now. In both cases, we had a bubble. Uh, then it was in the stock market. This time it was in real estate. In both cases, the bubble was created by a mistake in Fed policy. Um, in both cases, in my view, the, Fed, uh, the mistake was exacerbated, if not caused, by a malfunction in the international financial system. In the 1920s, the problem was between U.S. and Europe. By contrast, the recent bubble was associated with the imbalance between the U.S. and Asia. Uh, among other problems, this led to a massive accumulation of dollars in the hands of Asian central banks, which ended up providing the fuel for the credit and real estate bubble. Eventually, both bubbles, the stock market bubble in the 1920s and the real estate bubble this decade, burst, as bubbles always do. And both then and now, the bursting of the bubble eventually led to a banking crisis. In the 1930s, we had a conventional run on banks. Um, we, there was no deposit insurance, so uh, you would see lines of depositors um, queuing up to pull, out, pull their money out of banks and lit literally put it into, uh, into mattresses. This time around, because we have deposit insurance, we didn't see much of that, although we did see a few cases, IndyMac in California, uh, Northern Rock in the UK. This time, we experienced a run on what is known as the shadow banking system. 
instead of people physically lining up outside banks, we had a digital run. People just got onto their computers and moved millions of dollars out of institutions. Um, both after the bubble of the 1920s burst and, uh, and today, we've had many of the same tales of financial skullduggery emerge. The Bernie Madoff of that time was a Swedish industrialist by the name of Ivar Kreuger. He began as a manufacturer of matches, controlling a company called the Swedish Match Company. And in the early 1920s, he became a sort of international banker. Because of the overhang of debts after the First World War, most countries had trouble uh, borrowing on international capital markets, whereas the Swedish Match Company, because of its reputation, was able to get, um, get its hands on capital at reasonable rates. So Kreuger decided to exploit this competitive advantage by raising money in New York and offering to lend the money to countries in return for a monopoly over match manufacturing. It sounded like a great business. Among the countries that he struck such deals were Ecuador, Peru, Poland, Greece, Hungary, Yugoslavia, and Romania. Uh, in 1926, he negotiated a deal with France. In 1929, he negotiated a similar deal in, um, in Germany. Uh, he, was, he was an interesting character. He had six or seven residences, apartments in London, Berlin, on Park Avenue in New York, um, on the Avenue Victor Emmanuel in Paris, and each of them he installed a different girlfriend. Um, he was a confirmed bachelor who also went into the movie business and, by the way, was the man who discovered uh, Greta Garbo. Um, in an interview with the Saturday Evening Post, when asked... You know, to what did he owe his success? He said three things. One is silence, the second is more silence, and the third is still more silence. So you can see why I compare him to Bernie Madoff. Um, eventually, in 1932, the public woke up to the news that Kreuger had been found in his apartment in Paris with a bullet wound through the heart. Um, initially, people attributed the suicide to the tensions of the time, and there was a great sort of outpouring of sentiment in his favor. Within a few weeks, it emerged that his accounts were completely bogus, and his bondholders lost a total of $400 million, which is not very different from the $80 billion that people will have lost with Bernie Madoff uh, when translated into modern terms. Uh, then as now, the effect of the bursting bubble, the banking crisis, and the scandals um, cast discredit on all those involved in running and regulating the financial system. I mean, if you think outrage at the so-called greed um, of Wall Street is something new, you should get this. In 1933, the Senate organized hearings on the causes of the financial meltdown uh, that eventually became known as the Pecora hearings. Each of the heads of the major banks were summoned to Capitol Hill, and this is what emerged. It turned out that the president of Chase, Albert Wiggins, had made a fortune in the month of the crash, October 1929, about $4 million, equivalent today to several hundred million dollars, by shorting the stock of his own bank um, just before the market collapsed. I mean, talk about a conflict of interest. Um, Charlie Mitchell, the president of the National Citibank, the precursor uh, uh, of Citibank, earned a million dollars a year and had not paid a cent of income taxes for three years because he would sell the stock in his company to his family at a big loss uh, and then buy it back from them. Similarly, Jack Morgan, the son of J.P. Morgan, uh, was also forced to confess that he'd never paid taxes. Uh, the popular press started calling bankers banksters. Um, finally, in 1934, the Secretary of Treasury, under three presidents, Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover, Andrew Mellon, once dubbed the greatest Treasury Secretary since Alexander Hamilton, and by the way, the third richest man in the country. We know that because they used to actually publish people's tax returns. So, um, was indicted for having falsified his 1931 tax return. The Treasury demanded $3 million in back taxes, uh, which his estate eventually settled for 600000 
So as you can see, there are many echoes um, in today's headlines. So, so much for the similarities. What about the differences? Um, in December 1930, the world was then 16 months into what would become the Great Depression. Stock market was down about 50%. Profits had fallen by 50%. World industrial production had fallen by close to 20%. It may surprise you to know that as of May of this year, 16 months into the current recession, we're about at the same place. Stocks are down about the same amount, 40 to 50 percent. Profits are also down about the same amount, 40 to 50 percent. World industrial production is also down about 20 percent. So the difference is that in the 1930s, over the next 18 months, that's from January 1931 to July 1932, the bottom fell out of the world economy. Stock markets ended, ended up falling 70% by the end. World industrial production fell by another 25%. Um, I can confidently predict that none of this is going to happen again. Uh, the world economy collapsed in 1931 because the authorities applied the wrong medicine to what was already a very sick patient. Um, they let the banking system go under. They tried to cut the budget deficit by raising taxes. And folly of all follies, they even raised interest rates in the middle of the Depression. So you're probably asking yourself, why would they do such a thing? Uh, the reason was the gold standard. The gold standard was a system by which the amount of credit that central banks could provide was constrained by the amount of gold in their vaults. So countries losing gold were obliged to curtail credit and raise interest rates. As a consequence, in the middle of 1931, um, Germany raised interest rates, and this is the middle of the Great Depression, raised interest rates from 4% to 12%. Uh, Britain then did the same. And in the fall of 1931, the U.S. joined the scramble and also raised interest rates, not quite as much. It was actually in a, fa in a system that was even crazier than this. Because gold is very heavy and expensive to transport and insure, instead of shipping gold from one country to another, they developed a system called earmarking, where all central banks stored their gold either in the Bank of England or the Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, so some of the Bank of France's gold, for example, were held in the vaults of the Bank of England. So when Britain lost gold to France, what happened was a group of wo uh, workers would go down into the vaults of the Bank of England. They'd go over to a pile of gold ingots that belonged to the Bank of England. They'd load some ingots onto a little truck. They'd trundle it over to the other side of the vault. They'd offload it and then they'd put a little flag on it saying this now belonged to France. <laughs> so you had this crazy system where Britain, in effect, had to curtail credit, raise interest rates, and create mass unemployment because there was too much gold on one side of its vaults and not enough on the other. So it's no wonder that the global economy crumbled. Uh, the advantage of having been through the Great Depression is that we now know what not to do. I mean, we are not repeating the same mistakes. We're not letting the banking system go under. Um, the authorities have, have actually thrown a, a massive amount of money at the problem in order to support the banking system. Nor is there any attempt to curb budget deficits. Um, governments around the world have allowed their budget deficits to expand um, by something like 6% of GDP uh, every, uh, for, uh, per year. And no one is planning to raise interest rates. No one um, is trying to crucify their economy um, on a cross of gold or in defense of the currency. Um, the three major policy mistakes that they made during the Great Depression, allowing the banking system to collapse, letting, trying to curtail the budget deficit and raising interest rates, were a reflection of the fact that policymakers then simply did not understand how the economies operated. Uh, they were like 18th century doctors who thought that the cure for illness was to draw blood from the patient. Uh, we now know better. 
So, if this time we're applying the right medicine, propping up the banking system, expanding the budget deficit, uh, cutting interest rates, does that mean we can all sleep soundly at night? Uh, you got the answer. Unfortunately, not. Here are four things to keep you up at night. <laughs> and I'm going to stick for a while with medical analogy, although I'll probably mess it up at some point. Uh, the first is that while we've learned enough not to give them, uh, the economy the wrong medicine. It turns out that figuring out the right dose of the right medicine and giving it on a timely basis is also important. Uh, let me give you an example from the 1930s. In, 19, in 1932, led by a new chairman, Eugene Meyer, who is the father of the late Catherine Graham, uh, a very energetic man, a self-made millionaire, very far cry from the non-entities that had previously been at the head of the Fed, um, he finally woke up and said, we've been doing the wrong things. So the Fed moved to inject a, a bit, one and a half billion dollars of reserves into the system. Uh, Meyer persuaded Hoover, who was a good friend of his, that the federal government should inject equity into the banking system. So they injected one and a half billion dollars of equity into the banking system, which is translated into modern terms as roughly $300 billion, not very different from how much we've injected in under the top. Um, and guess what? Nothing happened. The Fed had left it too late. So despite the injection of money and capital into the system, banks had lost so much money and been so badly burnt by two and a half years of economic downturn that they were so gun-shy now, all they did was hoard the money. Uh, that is not very different from what is happening today. Um, I'm going to stick with a medical analogy for one more round. The second thing to worry about is that while we may have the same disease um, as we had during the Great Depression, you know, caused by a bubble that burst in a banking crisis, this time we may have a strain that is incurable with existing medicines. Uh, the, I suppose the economic equivalent of having an antibiotic resistance form of tuberculosis. In the 1920s, the size of the banking system was about $50 billion um, and GDP was $100 billion. Bank assets amounted to 50% of GDP. And it was a very plain vanilla system. I mean, banks took deposits, made loans, and made investments. It was very simple. Now, if you take the banking system and the shadow banking system in the U.S., it is $20 trillion. That is 150% of GDP. The equivalent in Britain is 450% of GDP. I mean, I fear that we may have created a sort of Frankenstein in the financial system uh, that is become too large, half of it securitized and channeled through markets that are difficult to control, I mean, basically too complex for the central bank to get its arms around. Uh, a corollary of the very large size of the financial system is the overhang of consumers' debt. Uh, so we may be in a situation where the conventional tools like for getting the economy moving, like the economic st stimulus package, just has only a muted impact because Consumers take the money that the Fed injects into the system or, the, uh, or the, the, uh, the government injects into the system and use it to pay down their debts. And so we never get an economy that gets off the ground. So that's the second thing to worry about, the disease, the variant of the disease that's sort of resistant to medicine. Okay, I'm going to move away from medical analogies. The third thing to worry about is politics. Um, in my book, I write that the Great Depression was the result of a failure of intellectual will, the consequences of simply not understanding how the economy worked. The risk this time is we have an economic catastrophe, not because we don't know what to do, but out of a failure of political will. Uh, so while we know what to do, with it, uh, to, to do, the political system just doesn't allow us to get it done. Uh, let me give you one example, and there are many. Um, take something that not enough people are talking about. You, you've all heard endless, you've all read endless articles about the U.S. banking problem. 
what you've probably not read about is the European banking problem. Uh, banks in Europe have lost a lot of money. Uh, some of it in Eastern Europe, some of it on U.S. mortgages, some of it domestically. They actually, relative to the size of banks, they have less capital than the U.S., and they've recognized less of their losses. Uh, so ultimately, as in the case of the U.S. banking problem, uh, taxpayers are going to have to foot the bill. The problem in Europe is you ask yourself, which taxpayers? Uh, the taxpayers of the smaller European countries in which many of these banks are located can't do it on their own, so the burden will have to fall on the rich countries uh, of Europe, especially Germany and France. Uh, you know, there been, there's been a lot of criticism of the way the U.S. has gone about dealing with its banking, system, banking problems, but at least the U.S. has a federal system and thus the sort of national cohesion and political machinery to get New Yorkers and Midwesterners to pay for the mistakes of Californians and Floridian homeowners. <laughs> there is no such mechanism in Europe. I mean, it's going, to be, it's going to require political leadership of the highest order to persuade, to get the leaders of Germany and France to persuade their thrifty and prudent taxpayers and Germans and the French have actually been incredibly thrifty and prudent over the last decade to bail out foolhardy Austrian banks and Hungarian uh, homeowners. So we may have a situation where everyone knows what, the thing, what needs to be done, um, but we just have a political system that doesn't allow it to happen. That is, in effect, what happened in Japan. Because of political constraints, they were only able to do enough to stabilize the banking system, drip-feeding their, assist, uh, their assistance over time, uh, and they were never able to do enough to restore the banking system to health. Uh, the consequence was that though they avoided a depression, they had to live through a lost decade of economic stagnation. Fourth problem is the international arena. Uh, one of the best historians of the Great Depression, Charles Kindleberger, used to argue uh, that ultimately the Great Depression came about because of failure of economic leadership on the world stage. Uh, he thought that a well-functioning global economy required some country to act as a leader, in effect to do more than its fair share of keeping the global economy afloat, to be the supplier of capital of last resort during the crises, to be the engine of growth when things go, went down, recognizing that small countries will freeload off your efforts. That's what it means to be the leader. Before the First World War, Britain had assumed the role, but almost bankrupted by the war, it was no longer able to. The mantle of leadership should have passed to the U.S., uh, but the leaders of the U.S. were too insular and parochial to seize the opportunity. Thus, during the 30s, Britain was unable to lead and the U.S. was unwilling. So as a consequence, there was an economic recovery during the 1930s, but the, the world was only able to get out of its hole, and the countries of the world were only able to get out, the, out of their hole by hunkering down behind high tariff barriers, import controls, restrictions on capital flows. It was a time of the worst sort of populism and nationalism. So you have to ask yourself, are we at a similar transition point? Uh, the U.S. is clearly doing a lot to get its economy out of its hole. But are we doing more than we, our fair share? Or is it a case that we've got so many, um, we've got sort of all, so many weaknesses, accumulated current account deficit, um, debts to China, bank, uh, our own banking problems, foreign policy disasters, that we're, we're incapable of taking on more than our fair share? And is anyone else standing there who, who can do it? Uh, will Europe do it? I don't think so. Um, is China able to, or is it still too small? So I would like to end by quoting Montague Norman, um, uh, who, though he, uh, though he was not a great central banker, was, would have been a very charming person to have had dinner with. And, uh, 
Uh, towards the end of his life, after the Second, uh, the Second World War, he came up with a very poignant assessment of what he and the other central banks, bankers had achieved. Here's what he wrote. As I look back, it now seems that with all the thought and work and good intentions which we provided, we, we achieved absolutely nothing. Nothing that I did and very little that old Ben did, that's Ben Strong, internationally produced any good effect. In if, indeed, any effect at all, except that we collected a lot of money from a lot of poor devils and gave it over to the four winds. Let us hope that in a few years we're not saying that. Thank you. So, question. Uh, I, I said we'd. Uh, I was told we would have some time for questions. So. So many questions, so little time. <laughs> uh, given the uh, policy decisions that have been made by the new administration, and possibly even the uh, prior one, plus what's been going on with the treatment of debt with uh, General Motors and, and Chrysler, I was wondering, in both your roles as uh, an economist and also as an investment manager, uh, and also given what is probably going to be the continuing opaqueness in the derivatives market, uh, how do you see the problem of pricing risk going forward into the future? Uh, there's, well, le let me first start with an anecdote out of my, um, um, out of my book. Uh, the, I didn't say that the hero of my book is John Maynard Keynes. Um, and uh, in, in 1932, he was a speculator and made and lost a lot of money during the 20s uh, betting on currencies. And in 1932, thinking that Roosevelt's program to get the economy moving would work, with the stock market having gone down 85%, he put all his money into the stock market uh, on margin. Um, and um, this was in, um, actually, yeah, in 1932. Stock market um, took off, um, and um, by 1936, he, he had put in about $50,000. By 1936, he was worth $2.5 million. Um, and you know, which is the equivalent of, I don't know, $20 million, $30 million today. Uh, so the moral of the story is, you know, the, the best time to invest is when it's darkest. So, you know, in March, when we all thought the world was going to collapse, that was the best time to, um, time to invest. <coughs> so uh, my view is that, look, we've had a massive adjustment in lots of asset prices. Um, you know, despite the rally in the stock market since, since you know, the middle of March, um, most stock markets are down 50% from the highs. Uh, I think that what the administration has done, what governments around the world have done, will turn this thing around. Uh, we're not going back to the old days, uh, so we're not going to get a situation where, um, you know, Risk is going to get priced at ridiculously low levels, but I think you're being very compensated to take risk here, and still after the rally. Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful lecture. My question is about global imbalances, and specifically about China and its sort of co-dependent relationship with the United States. And my sense is that neither party is willing to really discuss this in a way that's cogent and coherent over, say, the next 10 years. And I'm interested in your comments about who are the personalities who might help make this happen? And not just China, but Japan and all of these Asian families. And who are those personalities and how do we try and raise that and move it in ways that are ultimately productive? Um, yeah, very good question. I, I actually think that we're going to deal with this problem or that the, the problem will be dealt with by circumstances. What made this codependent relationship possible was that 
China and Asia in the late 90s embarked on this massive export boom. So China's exports went from 200 billion in 1997 or something to 2 trillion just recently. Uh, that was only possible because U.S. consumers went on a buying binge and got into debt. Um, the U.S. consumer is tapped out. Uh, so what we've seen is our current account deficit has gone, um, which is basically how much we buy from foreigners relative to what we uh, export to them, has gone from, in, a, in the space of a year, has gone from 6 to 7 percent of GDP to 2. Uh, and I suspect it's going to go to zero because I think consumers just cannot afford to I think the consumer savings rate will go from, it's gone from zero to five, I think it'll go to back to ten. So that's the markets, so that's the demand side. We're not going to be able to pay for Chinese goods. So the question is, what do they do? The risk is that we get, that basically all of Asia tries to keep up with the same model. If they keep their foot on this export accelerator while the market, while the major market is sort of not growing, what they're going to be doing is competing against each other. And the risk, this, I mean, I suppose the worst case risk is that we get a trade war of China, Korea, all of these guys uh, with all this excess capacity in manufacturing trying to, trying to pursue the old model. And they will hurt themselves very badly. And, I, you know, it won't be pretty, and there'll be a lot of political um, and social tension. The second alternative is that the, uh, the Chinese in particular, but all of the Asian countries, realize that they've got to reorient their um, economic model. I mean, uh, it seems to me that they will do that out of self-interest. Uh, they're, they're run by people who understand these things just as well as you and I, and they're going to realize that that's just that path is not going is not going anywhere. So that's my that's my assessment. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> give us, if you will, uh, um, a, a quick glimpse of those um, events. Um, in, uh, in the 30s and in the 40s, which you feel contributed materially to the upturn of, of our economic circumstances. Um, clearly, war preparation would be an obvious one, but there must have been some decisions that were made that were right. And what kinds of decisions do you foresee in our circumstances today that, that, that what should we look for that might actually be the right the right step for the country or for some group of citizenry to, to, to take? Um, well, there's, I mean, there's a very simple answer to what got the world out of the Depression, and that was getting off the gold standard. That that single, the New Deal, almost all of the New Deal, the New Deal was great. I mean, it provided um, a sort of safety net for individuals and introduced all sorts of things that were designed to deal with the consequences of the Great Depression. Most of the New Deal programs did not create a recovery. Uh, FDR was still hung up about this idea that the government should not run large budget deficits. So every time he, he ex expanded government programs, he raised taxes. But he did one thing, and he did it in the typical FDR fashion. He once wandered into the office uh, and all his advisors were sitting around, and he said, you know, by the way, we're, um, in, his, in his nonchalant way, he said, by the way, we're off the gold standard. <laughs> and there was an outcry, and all his advisors, who were very traditional Wall Streeters, you know, tried to persuade him that he was completely wrong. Um, and one guy um, uh, told him this was the end of Western civilization. <laughs> and it obviously wasn't. You know, the world, and, it, and you can trace... Every country, you can trace when each country recovered from the Great Depression by when they left the gold standard. Because it basically let go of that straitjacket on credit. Um, 
I think the, the sort of big moral of the sort of meta moral of my book is that you've got to look for that sacred cow, which everyone tells you uh, if you tried to do this, this would be the end of Western civilization, and it turns out this is actually what's holding us back. So I've been trying to think of what might be today's sacred cow. And I suspect, but I'm not going to, you know, I'm, um, you know, take it for what it's worth. I mean, I'm not in, I, I was an economist, you know, 30 years ago. Um, is the overhang of debt is so large that at some point, I think we're going to need some systemic, massive debt forgiveness package. And I don't know whether it's, you know, I might sound like a Trotskyite, but, you know, there is something there that, you know, it, it's better to just agree that we can't pay these debts, and I don't know how we do it, but that's, that's the sort of thing that I think we're going to be talking about. I've, I've heard this point made where someone said, when we have a global currency, then you'll be able to discuss the forgiveness of debt in the capacity you're expressing. That rather than the dollar being the denomination of international currency, that some kind of forged or hybrid currency is the beginning of the, the debt yeah, I mean, program it, it, you're talking about. And I think, yeah, there are lots of preconditions for what, um, yeah. Uh, that's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for your life and for your wonderful book. I'm interested to hear you talk more about what is the shadow of the human system, its role in the current economic crisis, and its future. Okay. Um, two statistics. Uh, Citibank has a balance sheet, um, I think it's of $2 trillion. It turned out that Citibank had created a whole series of off-balance sheet offshore entities where they would put only a tiny sliver of capital. They would put a whole lot of their um, loans to subprime and well, actually all mortgages or the AAA portions. Those entities would then issue commercial paper that commercial paper would end up uh, in yours and my money market fund and in some large institutional money market funds. So, and th that portion of Citibank is equal to what was actually on their books. So we had, in effect, if you like, a entity which was borrowing from money market funds that was borrowing in Citibank's name, but didn't appear on Citibank's accounts. And if you add up all of that, the U.S. banking system is about $10 trillion that's on, you know, that's on people's balance sheet, and the off-balance sheet items are roughly the same amount. Secondly, um, the U.S. dollar balance, uh, banking system is $10 trillion, it also turns out that the dollar balance sheet of European banks is $7 trillion. I mean, that's a gigantic number. Uh, the Royal Bank of Scotland, until it cratered, was the largest single bank in the world. Not because it had the most number of clients or because it had the greatest number of corporate lending relationships, but it thought it had discovered a free source of money. It would borrow money in the wholesale market at LIBOR, which is the bank lending rate, minus 10 basis points, and would go and invest in these AAA asset backs at LIBOR plus 10 basis points. And because all of these things were supposed to be AAA, it didn't have to have any capital. And this was free, this was just, a, you know, they thought this was free profits. And they, uh, at its height, the Royal Bank of Scotland had a balance sheet of two and a half trillion dollars, which is larger than the GDP of Britain. Uh, so, you know, that's what the shadow bank, that's what I mean by the shadow banking system. And one of the dilemmas is that in this whole process of getting our arms around it and letting the air gently out, you know, this it's it's not clear, you know, how Britain takes its financial system that's 450% of GDP 
and gets it to a, um, a reasonable number without some accident. So, I mean, that's... Um, I, I'm not sure what the future is. I, I, the mind boggles at how we got to where we were. From the Fed. Very, very uh, quick comment. As a native uh, Georgian, I would like to point out that Jekyll Island meeting was 1910. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. November 22nd, I believe. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I'm going to duck that one. <laughs> I really, you know, I, um, who knows? I mean, the, look, the, the risk is that we think we can go back to, that we, we basically go through the cycle we've been through three or four or five times over the last 20 years and that we have just another one of the same sort, that we keep the shadow banking system go, going and we have the same sort of regulations and we start another bubble somewhere. I, I haven't a clue where that would be. I find that so unlikely because people have been so badly shaken by this that I've got to believe this is a turning point. I mean, this is 19, you know, this is 1932. But thanks for the Jekyll Island thing. It is in my book, but I've, I've even forgotten some of the facts in my own book. So. <laughs> uh, given that Washington seems to be moving on a course of creating more and more debt for the country, um, and I, I view, you look at certain countries that have practically been ruined by their heavy debts, what do you think of the planning that's going on in Washington now? Do you think we, we need to cut back, or if you could run things in Washington, what steps might you take differently from what our leaders are currently doing? Okay, one of the great epigraphs of my book was um, Will Rogers. If stupidity got us into it, why can't stupidity get us out? <laughs> and, and the basic... The basic idea is, you know, we got into it by borrowing too much money. How can borrowing more money get us out? But that's economics for you. <laughs> Look, this, these large, uh, fiscal expansion is like, you've got it, you're in a tr ditch. You've driven your car into a ditch. Uh, you need fiscal expansion. Fix, fiscal expansion is like a tow truck to get you out of the ditch. It's a temporary measure and you should, not, you should not be sitting there when you're trying to get out of the ditch sort of worrying about the price of the tow truck. You should just get out of the ditch. Uh, so I actually think the stimulus package could potentially be larger. There's a different issue, which is once we're out, uh, I don't think we as a country have ever recognized that we're not willing to pay for the things that we want. And that's, that, may be, and that may be a matter of cutting the things we want, or it may be a, thing, a matter of saying, we're going to pay more. And I don't know what the right balance is, but I could certainly imagine a, you know, a very happy United States with a higher tax rate. And I know, you know that's, that doesn't go down well in some cir circles, but it seems to me... If you want all of the things that we uh, want to give ourselves, we should pay for it. In light of the uh, National Bank that Alexander Hamilton advocated, you know, we apparently have a form of the Federal Reserve. How do you explain China's advocating of going to a world currency in light of the fact, I think personally, the, the printing of money has just totally gotten out of control? to the point that they don't want to have their debt just inflated away like what happened with the market after World War I or what's currently happening in Zimbabwe. Okay, um, look, we used to have an international reserve which was gold and the supply of it was too limited. We ended up moving after 1945 uh, to an international system where the primary reserve currency was the dollar. 
The problem with that is there was this big contradiction in the system. It was, and it was identified in the early 1960s, which is that the only way you can accumulate dollars if you're France or Germany was for the U.S. to run a current account deficit. So basically, the only way for Germany to accumulate dollars was for the U.S. to get into debt. So the question everyone said is, do I want to keep on accumulating the currency of a country that is always perpetually getting into more debt? So there was this inherent contradiction of a system where one currency works as the primary reserve currency, and we've had, we, we have never resolved that dilemma. And it, there are two elements to that dilemma. One is that from the point of view of other countries, they think the fact that we're the world's reserve currency gives us a free pass, uh, that we can do all sorts of things that other countries would be disciplined uh, from, do, uh, from not doing uh, because people don't have to hold their currency, whereas because places like, uh, well, the whole world wants to hold dollars, that has given us a free pass. So China's move or tr China's attempting to come up with a world currency or talk about a world currency is something that surfaced many times before. We were talking a lot about it in the 1970s when we last had a dollar crisis. Whether that's feasible is very difficult because you've got to find an entity that's going to issue that global currency and that everyone has enough confidence to sort of give them the right to issue this world currency. And I'm not sure we've struck upon an entity that has the right. Well, pre-'64, though, they still had to check the balances of the silver issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.